<laughs> so we'd like to thank everyone for coming out today. Uh, this might be the only time we get to stand on the stage and say we'd like to thank the Academy. So it's our one moment. Yay for yes. us. All right. My name's Kevin Awakuni, and I'm a librarian from the Exploration and Creativity Department of the Los Angeles Public Library. Joining here uh, with me is Diana Olivo Posner, Principal Librarian and Associate Director of my department, my boss. So thank you for coming today. Uh, before we begin, we'd like to thank the National Endowment of the Humanities, our Library Foundation, and our behind the scenes staff for helping bring the LMAID program to you. LMAID focuses on the diverse landscape of, the Lo of Los Angeles, highlighting the immense artistic and performance talent that has developed in the course of the city's eclectic history. If you would like to see more of our amazing programs, please visit our online calendar at lapl.org forward slash events. And our LA Made program, please visit lapl.org forward slash LA Made. Our website also has blog posts and video links that highlight the library's diverse resources and upcoming programs. Uh, we would also like to take this opportunity to recognize and acknowledge the first people of this land, honor their elders past and present, as well as their descendants who are residents of these nations. For more information on which territory you might reside on, check out native-land.ca. Uh, just a couple of other housekeeping tips before we begin. Uh, please silence any of your electronics so as to not disturb anyone during the uh, speaking performance. Uh, please take a moment to just notice uh, the locations of the exits, um, just in case. Uh, if you parked in the garage in the li underneath the library today, you can get your parking validated at the information desk, uh, which is right outside the rotunda. Um, you will only be charged $1 as long as you validate um, if you parked after 1 and you leave before 5 p.m. Uh, so just want to let you know. And please, no eating or drinking in the auditorium. Uh, we appreciate that. And bathrooms are down the hallway and to your right. Lastly, we wanted to let you know that we will be announcing the winners of the book, which is right up there on that table, at the end of the program. So please stay seated afterwards, and we'll be announcing winners. And if you are one of the lucky seats, congrats. We'll be getting an un you'll be getting a signed copy of Regeneration, the Academy Museum Catalog. And for today's amazing program, Academy Museum of Motion Pictures pres President and Director Jacqueline Stewart will be discussing Regeneration, Black Cinema, 1898 through 1971, and will be in conversation with Dr. Alan Scott from UCLA. As they discuss researching, archiving, and the cultural preservation of black participation in American cinema. Regeneration Black Cinema 1898 to 1971 is an exhibition currently showing at the Academy Museum. We were lucky enough to go and it is truly amazing. It explores the rich history of black participation in US cinema and its beginning and its beginnings to just beyond the civil rights movement. Both the exhi exhibition and conversation seek to contextualize how the archiving and preservation of lost or forgotten films filmmakers and performers can enrich and challenge the way we think about black history for a contemporary audience. <clears throat> uh, Jacqueline Stewart is the president and director of the Academy Museum of Motion Pictures. She's on the faculty of the Department of Cinema and Media Studies at the University of Chicago where she founded the Southside Home Movie Project. A recipient of the 2021 MacArthur Fellowship, she is also the host of Silent Sunday Nights and Turner Classic Movies, as well as the author of several books, including Migrating to the Movies, Cinema and Black Urban Mo Modernity, and co-editor of LA Rebellion, Creating a New Black Cinema, which you could check out from the library if you wanted to, so just FYI. Uh, today I should be joined by Professor Ellen C. Scott, PhD, who focuses on the cultural meanings and reverberations of film in African American communities, and more broadly, the relationship of media to the struggle for racial justice and equality. She's currently working on two projects, one examining the history of slavery on the American screen, and another on the history of classical Hollywood era black women film critics. And now let's welcome to our stage, Jacqueline and Ellen. Thank you for coming. It's great to be here. So let's start by talking a little bit about um, your road to um, becoming this uh, the head of the museum. How did that? 
How did you get there? You were a professor at Chicago, and then? Yep, that's right. Um, I was teaching film history at the University of Chicago for many years, and um, uh, started hosting, as mentioned, on Turner Classic Movies. And it was a really exciting moment for me to think about how to be a professor, but just in a much bigger way, mm -hmm. to share film history, to introduce films to people that they had not seen before, or to see films that they knew, but in a different light. Mm -hmm. And then I was approached by the folks who were you know, putting the Academy Museum project together. The museum hadn't opened yet, just opened in September of 2021. And um, it seemed like the best possible way to bring together the interest that I have as a historian, as someone who's interested to show films to people because we do programming all the time. Uh, I was also leading the publications department, so our catalogs, the museum is really invested in documenting our exhibitions and being an educational resource for people both inside of the museum and far beyond the museum. So I was you know, amazed to be asked to join the museum and when I did, it really does feel to me like it's a way of extending the research, the programming, and the public education mission that's so important to me. That makes a lot of sense. Yeah. 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 So um, can we talk a little bit about regeneration? Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Maybe so, I can forward. Yeah, we'll look at some and images from regeneration. Nice slides here. Mm -hmm. Maybe. There we go. <laughs> Yes. So um, let's talk a little bit about how the exhibition came together, um, what amount of time it took, what resources went into this, sure. um, and what it's trying to do. Yeah, absolutely. So Regeneration, Black Cinema, 1898 to 1971, um, has been in the works for many years. Uh, the exhibition is curated by two brilliant curators, Doris Berger, who was on the Academy Museum's team. She's our Vice President of Curatorial Affairs. And the amazing Rhea Combs, who is the Director of Curatorial Affairs at the Smithsonian's National Portrait Gallery. Um, Doris talks about going into her research process at the Margaret Herrick Library, just looking up a variety of things. Margaret Herrick Library is the Academy's um, film library. It has scripts and posters and photographs and all kinds of costume design drawings. It's an amazing resource. So Doris was there and she saw what you're seeing on the screen, like all of these posters, but she didn't know any of these films. And she's a very, you know, knowledgeable film historian in her own right, but she became deeply curious, like what are these films? And uh, that was really the inspiration. She and another member of the curatorial team, Raul Guzman, started digging into this, and they started reaching out to people. So they reached out to us. We were actually invited to be part of the scholarly uh, sort of advisory committee for Regeneration, going back to 2017, 2018. Yeah. Um, and uh, that's where this exhibition began. Like, how can we give people a picture of not just this separate black film industry that existed. So these are posters of films that we know as race movies. These were films that were made in the first half of the 20th century during the days of racial segregation. Black cast films, many of them by black directors and writers, but not all of them. Because as you know, Ellen, like there were a lot of white filmmakers who recognized that there was a market here that was not being um, exploited or served. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, so there were black cast westerns and thrillers and mysteries and musicals. And what was really important about these films is that they gave black audiences an opportunity to see themselves at the center of the stories. Mm -hmm. um, and even if you wanted to criticize them for being imitations of Hollywood films, uh, they still meant so much to the black community. Mm -hmm. And so there are hundreds of these films, and many of them survive, not all of them. But these posters represent a really important archive for documenting that these movies were made, how they were marketed, um, and just seeing these black faces, like a whole world of black stars. Mm -hmm. I mean, every day in the galleries, people are in there shocked that they had no idea that at the same time that the classical Hollywood studio system was churning out thousands of films, that there was this other industry doing that too. 
It's a really fascinating history. And one of the things that I think is wonderful about the exhibition in particular is that it's not just reaching back to the things we know, you know, the, the elements of that film history that we already know. It's reaching back to the cutting edge of history. It's reaching out to the cutting edge. So many of the scholars I know um, were bringing in things, you know, you have some elements that are, that are pretty much brand new discoveries, right, that are a part of the exhibition. So, um, so that's really exciting too. There are a couple posters up there I had never seen before <laughs> as a film historian. Um, and the Soundies machine, I mean, there's so many things that people don't know about. So yeah. what are a few of those that you um, wow. might draw attention to? Yeah, well, I could point out something in this image here. So you see a camera in the foreground. Um, the exhibition, Regeneration, gets its name from a film. So. Uh, there's this really important race film company that was based in Jacksonville, Florida. The Norman Film Manufacturing Company, I believe is the full title. Richard Norman uh, was a white entrepreneur and he recognized the importance of making films and distributing them to African American audiences. He made a film called The Flying Ace, for example, which you can, and Black Gold, that's another one of the uh, Norman films. The Flying Ace, he had hoped that Bessie Coleman would star in that film, the black aviatrix. Um, but she died in a plane crash just before the production of that film was supposed to start. Um, so that camera, you know, it's one thing to see posters. It's another thing to see something that was actually used to make the films. And so across the exhibition, we try to do a mix of those kinds of elements that really shine a light on how the films were made in addition to the ways that they were they were marketed to people. Hmm. Fascinating. Yeah. Um, are there other elements of the exhibition yes. you'd want to draw attention to? And well, I love this room, room. so we'll, we'll talk yes. about this room. <laughs> so this is a gallery that focuses on music and film. And what you see in the center is an image from a film called Black and Tan. Duke Ellington is at the piano. It's his first film appearance, and Freddie Washington, who you may know from the 1934 film Imitation of Life, where she plays Piola, the tragic mulatta. Uh, she's a dancer in the film and, and Duke Ellington's love interest. It's a short, um, really beautifully shot film. I know it's one that's really striking to you too, Ellen, the way that it has this kind of art deco quality. And we actually designed the gallery to pick up on the style of this, uh, of this clip. So this is a gallery that really thinks about how important film was to giving black musical artists visibility. And then, you know, the, the I guess, converse of that is that um, thinking about the way that the film industry really was uh, driving a lot of energy from black musicians. Mm -hmm. So we have Louis Armstrong, one of his uh, trumpets is on display in this gallery. And what you can see over on the right side is an image of Josephine Baker on that smaller screen. And the curators really delve into her history as a performer. She appeared in you know, a group of films that she made in France where she was just, um, you know, just such a powerful icon mm. um, and energized all of these artistic traditions and practices in France. And our dear friend and colleague, Terry Francis, has written a wonderful book about Josephine Baker's film career. And she talks about how African-American audiences were really watching everything that Josephine Baker did. So even though she left the United States and went to France, black folks were still following her, admiring the work that she was doing, cheering her on, um, you know, and recognizing that she was taking advantage of opportunities that she couldn't have had here. She certainly could not have been a movie star in Hollywood in the 1930s. And I think that's a big part of what the exhibition does well is draw out these voices of women, particularly who um, may not have, you know, it's not until 1980 that we have the first black woman making a feature film in the United States. Um, so how were women expressing, black women expressing themselves oftentimes behind, you know, they were in front of the camera, right? They were, they were doing things behind the scenes to create a character, right? So I, I'm just um, curious, are there other places in the exhibit that um, women's voices are highlighted that you would want to point out? Yeah, absolutely. So um, we have an area of the gallery where we focus on Hattie McDaniel. And uh, as the first black person to win the Academy Award for playing the role of Manny in Gone with the Wind. 
So, you know, there has been lots of debate about should that film have been made? Should the book have been written? Why was it such a big hit? Why would she take this role? What does it mean that it's in a mammy role mm -hmm. that the first black person gets an Academy Award? Um, but she was very clear that she took the role because she was practicing her craft and that she was seeing herself on a path that could open up opportunities for the future. Mm. So, you know, it's never easy to be the pioneer in that way. Right. So we feature her speech and she actually worked with a colleague to write her own speech. She didn't deliver the speech that the studio had written for her. Mm. Um, and then we also have an image of her at the ceremony itself where because that venue was a segregated venue, um, it was only by like special permission that she was even allowed to be there. Hmm. And she was not seated with the rest of the cast of Gone with the Wind. She was seated sort of at the edge of the room and you can just see her, the t she's just a tiny little face at the bottom of the picture. Hmm. Um, so it's really important to recognize what she endured. Yes. Um, but she was always such a forward thinking person and that's what I think is important about the exhibition as well. You move from gallery to gallery looking at the 1890s, the 1910s, 20s, 30s, 40s, into the late 1960s and early 70s. And as you move through, you can really see every generation is building on the struggles and the accomplishments of the previous generation. And they're always thinking, what is the groundwork that I'm laying for people to come after me? Hmm. Yeah. And black women have always done that kind of work. Yes, yeah. absolutely. Um, yeah, so I'm thinking about how um, your work before with the Chicago uh, Home Movie Project yeah, yeah. Um, sort of speaks to the community value of film mm. and the, the role that community plays in both home life, community life, et cetera. Um, and I'm wondering if you can talk a little bit about either how this exhibit or the Academy Museum more broadly engages with that kind of history. Oh, that's a great question, yeah. Um, no, I've, it's always been really important to me to connect film history to the people who make it. And to me, the people who make film history are not only the people who make films, and certainly not only the people who make big budget Hollywood, you know, mainstream narrative films. So I became very interested in home movies uh, because, have you all made home movies? <laughs> right, yes. I mean, we all make them on our phones now, but before that, people were making them on camcorders, and then before that, people were making them on film cameras. So I started a project just inviting people, do you have these old eight millimeter, super eight millimeter films? And it turns out a lot of people have them. And they're silent, and there's a whole, so sort of international movement around preserving home movies. There's a center for home movies. There's an event called Home Movie Day. It happens here in LA and many other places around the world. And I kind of follow that model. Invite people to kind of dig in there. Well, I'm in Chicago, so we have basements. I don't have basements here. Basements, attics, garages. Um, and uh, then we would show them, and people would narrate them. That's my aunt. That's my grandmother, this is my high school, this was this Christmas morning, and so on. And um, they couldn't show the films themselves because people didn't have projectors anymore, but it was the way that the films could activate that kind of storytelling mm. that was so magical, and I think empowering. So we digitized the films, and there are other projects that do similar things, but the hyper-localness of just focusing on the south side of Chicago, and then inviting people to come in public and just speak to the meaning of the films. I mean, that's also, to me, captured in so much of what we do at the museum, um, because we're inviting people to connect to films that mean something to them and hopefully talk about them. It shouldn't be a space where you just sort of silently walk through this exhibition. You should come with people you know, <laughs> to see these exhibitions and talk to the other people in the gallery. You know, like, this is a public space. It's a civic space. and. Uh, if we can generate that kind of like respectful dialogue, especially across the differences, that's one of the things that the project, the Home Movie Project did, because the South Side of Chicago, very still racially segregated area, and you'd have these families who never would have interacted with each other back in the 60s or the 50s, but when they show the movies together, it's like, oh my God, my mom had that same lamp, <laughs> you know, whatever. 
they, they saw some commonality. Mm -hmm. And I think that's part of what amateur films can do. And I, I think this kind of film history can do that too. Is there a particular film from that project that you can talk about a little bit? Oh I'm just gosh. curious. Yes. I've seen a few of them, and they're just, some of them are really magnificent. Yeah. I mean, they're real artists working at home. Yeah, yeah. I mean, one of, uh, a friend of mine who didn't really know about the project, I showed some films, and he runs to his aunt's house <laughs> and called me. <laughs> He's like, oh, we've got some of these films. It turned out to be an amazing collection, the Gene Patton collection over 100 films. Uh, and her husband was the first um, uh, sort of captain and of the uh, Illinois Police Department. Wow. This is a man who made bullets, his own bullets in his basement. Wow. Okay. Anyway, so many interesting <laughs> things. But one of the real shows off their new kitchen. Hmm. She's got these gold lame pants on. Mm -hmm. And everything in the kitchen is gold. <laughs> gold refrigerator, gold stove. And she's just opening and closing. And it, uh, the whole thing is online, anyway. <laughs> I just love the pride. And then she starts to play solitaire on, the ta on her new like, gold table. <laughs> love it. Yes. So first of all, you just don't see images of black women mm. in the 1960s like that mm. at all. But then secondly, it was the love. It was the love of the home. It was the love the husband had for her mm. and the family space that they were creating for each other. Mm. Um, yeah, it's very simple, but, but very meaningful. Mm. And we have home movies in the exhibition, too. Right. We have um, home movies from uh, Cab Calloway and the Nicholas Brothers are featured in, ex in the exhibition. So that gives you another side, too of their personal lives. Yes, yeah. and Josephine Baker, right? And Josephine Baker, yes, 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 that's right. Putting some makeup on. <laughs> yes. yes, and she had many children, right? She yeah. has, yes, this, um, what did she call her, rainbow? The rainbow? Rainbow. Tribe, <laughs> yes. Yeah, we see them, yeah. 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 yeah, and her love for them. That's wonderful. That's yeah, so great. We're gonna go forward on this Oh, slide. yeah, we better go. Because we have lots of cool, look at that. <laughs> Um, so do you want to talk a little bit about an element, um, just thinking about Black History Month, and, and is, there, is there a figure in black film history that the exhibition points to that folks should know about that they sure. might not know about? Sure, yeah. Well, I could talk about these two people, oh, all right. but I'll talk about another one first um, that we were speaking about when we were doing our tech check today, uh, Burt Williams legendary vaudevillian recording artist, the, the most famous entertainer of the early 20th century. He was um, performed with the Ziegfeld Follies, uh, Bahamian by background. Um, very light-skinned man who wore blackface when he performed because he was performing in that kind of minstrel-related vaudevillian tradition. Um, there's been a lot written about Burt Williams. Um, in connection to his use of blackface. He, from what I, my interpretation of what he, he said about it and the way that he performs, my sense is that he felt that it was an art form and that he was elevating that as an art form. Mm. He's brilliant as a, as a comedian. And it's, it's fortunate for us that there are film documentations of his performance styles. He made several short films. And what we feature in the gallery is a feature length film that was actually never finished. Mm -hmm. that was um, discovered in the archives of MoMA. I say discovered because it was in MoMA's archives since the late 1930s. Mm. But it was only quite recently identified and the archivists there started to work on it and it has been just an extraordinary project because you see the making of the film. So you see him not in character and then snap into character. And that's incredibly valuable mm -hmm. because when you only see black people cooning and clowning, you don't know how they feel about it, or you don't get that space, like that gap that shows that it's a performance. Mm -hmm. But this footage shows us them gearing up for the shot, doing the shot, and then getting out of it again. And the cast is joking around. It's a black cast film. He's the only one in blackface. So that's another thing. It's not like everybody's like, ugh, I don't want to work with this guy. I mean, like it was normalized. Mm -hmm. And he's the star. He's the biggest star in the United States at this point. So there's a respect that people have for him. Mm -hmm. 
and, uh, and there's a camaraderie that you see. So I think that the film footage that we're featuring from MoMA, courtesy of MoMA in the exhibition, not only can introduce people to Burt Williams and his, really, the way he moves his eyes and the way that he, um, he dances. There's a 1913 Soul Train line in this film. <laughs> She's no, no, and I'm there. Yeah, there's they're, they're standing two lines, and then people take turns dancing down. Yes, that's the Soul Train line, right? <laughs> 1913. And this is Cakewalk, right? At the yes, time? yes, right. Yeah, yes. Mm -hmm. So you see him in his element, and all these other just like incredibly talented black performers that he was a part of. Um, but if you know something about him, you just you, you learn more yes. when you can really focus in on how he performed. That film is really fascinating, partly because of, um, I'm trying to remember her name, but his co-star, Odessa. Uh, Odessa Warren Gray. Warren Gray, who yes. was a milliner, right? That's right. And was involved in making some of her own costumes, I think, for the production. Was there actually a, a black assistant director or co-director on that? I know that was mentioned. Yeah, what's his name? Yeah, there was. Yeah. yeah. So these are some of the amazing finds um, that are part of the exhibition. Totally that are recent, right? I mean, in 2014. No, that's right. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And the image you see up here, we have a larger image of it later, of the couple kissing. Um, St. Subtle and Gertie Brown, two vaudevillians, recorded doing this very brief and flirtatious kiss with each other in 1898. Mm. Um, we don't think about 19th century cinema very mm -hmm. much. Very true. But to uh, that was also footage that was at USC. Mm. And, um, and was only very recently identified. Wow. So, you know, the material is out there. And I think an exhibition like this, and the, it inspires people to find more and to ask for more. Yes. Yeah, yeah that's a big part of it. It's just knowing what you're looking for, because sometimes it's there. Mm -hmm. But that maybe we should talk a little bit about the politics of archival practice yeah. and what gets preserved, what doesn't, how things get prioritized or not. Sure. Yeah, it's tricky, I think. Um, I mean, I think that conventionally, film history had not really been valued in relation to other aspects of social history, political history. Um, fortunately, archives like the Library of Congress, because people would submit films for copyright, mm -hmm. amassed a huge archive of films. Mm -hmm. MoMA in New York has a huge archive out here. The Academy, UCLA, USC, all have really significant film archives. Um, but just the sheer collecting of the material doesn't always, it's always too much to really process it all. Mm -hmm. So when it came to really recovering a lot of the histories that we're talking about in regeneration, you know, they're just worn out the, the scholars asking for it. Mm -hmm. um, archivists were not necessarily looking to preserve this material. And in fact, we know there are some cases Archivists might have seen something like that Burt Williams footage and thought, oh, this is like a blackface comedy thing. Maybe we don't want to deal with that. Right. You know, when there are histories that could be up for debate or contentious. Mm. Um, so fortunately, like, we're part of a generation of, of archivists and, and, and scholars who are actively asking for these things. And the more we ask, the more kind of turns up. Mm -hmm. And gets described. Even, it's things that are even sitting in archives right now then can become a priority. That happened for, for us at the Academy. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I'm going to go forward. Should we go forward? Yeah, <laughs> why not? Ah, so here's another gallery. Yes. In the Regeneration Exhibition that's looking at um, freedom movements. So here we think about, we're kind of going sort of from the uh, World War II period and forward into the 1960s to think about how black artists, black film artists, also used, to use a term everybody uses now, their platform, mm -hmm. to advance the black freedom struggle. So in this exhibition area, we talk about Ozzie Davis and Ruby Dee. We talk about Sidney Poitier, Harry Belafonte. Um, we have images in the back you can't really see there, but we see them all at the March on Washington, for example, how they were lending their star power to try to raise funds and raise awareness about, um, about civil rights. And then think about how some of the choices they made in terms of their films were also very much in dialogue with the notion that art can be a part of political change. Mm. 
I'm thinking, I'm remembering, because I know that wall. <laughs> because James Baldwin, right, and his yes. uh, version, is it the Malcolm X script? Malcolm or? X script, OK, yeah. yes, because he had written the, the script for a uh, version of Malcolm X that never came to be, right, that was converted to a documentary film. Um, you know, but he was very passionate about Malcolm and had things to say about him. Mm -hmm. um, so there are these histories there, too, of people who never um, you know, manage to get their screenplay idea fully realized within the Hollywood context. Yeah, so. yeah. We also have an image of Lorraine Hansberry, right, who had done an adaptation of her own play, *A Raisin in the Sun*. She had adapted it to be wonderful screenplay. It's been published, but that's not the version that ended up getting made mm -hmm. um, because she was kind of veering too much into some of the aspects of um, of racial inequality in Chicago, mm -hmm. but then like nationally is really what she was looking at but it was more than the studio was interested to do. Hmm. Yeah, Fascinating. And then we have Sidney Poitier's Oscar there for Lilies of the Field. Mm -hmm. So his first African-American actor to win that in that category. And then I'm seeing two Harry Belafontes up there, right? We have uh, Angel Levine, right? Uh -huh. And Odds Against Tomorrow. And he was he produced, right, Odds Against yes. Tomorrow, which is an interesting story as well. Yeah, no, it's really interesting to think about the things that they were doing, not just in front of the camera, but behind the camera. This is a really important point. Mm -hmm. We have a poster also for the film Uptight. Mm -hmm. um, and Ruby D was one of the writers of that film. And um, looking at sort of this conflict between nonviolent protest and, you know, more militant forms of protest in Cleveland, mm -hmm. her hometown. Um, and, you know, unfortunately, we don't think about those aspects of what those artists were doing, too. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Very true. All right, I'm going to go ahead. Oh, OK. <laughs> <laughs> oh, were you going to say something else about this one? Oh, no, no, no. I was done with that I one. Wanna, I was just I thinking about um, the art elements of this, because oh, yes. there are there's an overlay, and maybe it does segue nicely into the, the summit itself, because yeah. there was spoken word. Um, you know, there was a lot of engagement. Um, so um, I mean, that was one of the things that struck me, is how artistically engaged the exhibit is. Um, so I know the Isaac Julian piece is there. and Yeah, right. So um, the curators of the exhibition, Doris and Rhea, I don't know if we have an image. Do we have an image that shows it? Maybe, well, I'll just get you excited about it if you haven't <laughs> seen it. Um, they had the brilliant idea to incorporate works of contemporary black art in the exhibition. Uh, so there is uh, a Gary Simmons sculpture that refers to a photograph that shows people going up into the colored section of a Southern theater, but he's made it into a huge sort of you know, life-size version that really gets you to think about what that experience meant and what it means to be labeled in that way. Mm -hmm. There's a Kara Walker piece. There's a Theaster Gates piece. There's a Glenn Ligon piece. So um, uh, what they wanted to do is to really help the viewers of this exhibition recognize the ongoing meaning of this history that it's not just something that's relegated to the past, but instead this is a set of social circumstances and artistic practices that has inspired contemporary artists mm -hmm. as well. Um, and as you said, we have uh, an installation piece by Isaac Julian just outside of this exhibition. He produced a three-channel, a three-screen um, installation called Baltimore that is actually a tribute to Melvin Van Peebles. Mm -hmm. And the exhibition culminates with Melvin Van Peebles' film, Sweet Sweetback's Badass Song from 1971. Um, so that's another way that the exhibition kind of pushes into the contemporary moment mm -hmm. um, and, and helps us to think about the relationships, the multi-generational relationships between artists. Mm. Yeah. yeah. Fascinating. No, it's great. It's great. So the summit, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Summit. So the first weekend of this month, uh, we hosted what we call the Regeneration Summit. So we really didn't want to um, do programming that was, with all due respect to us, <laughs> just like a scholarly Sorry. symposium yeah. where you would invite like, you know, panel after panel of people reading 20-minute papers, which we've done many times, yes. yes. 
so and listened to many times. Yes. That it was really important to us that this would be a celebration and a community focused celebration. Um, that we would inspire and really sort of brainstorm ways to connect young people to this history. So we did all kinds of things, and I'm looking over at Marty Preciado because so much of the work that she does leading our community and impact department at the museum was um, critical to the way that this, ex this, this celebration materialized. So we partnered with lots of community organizations and arts organizations. We had spoken word. We had uh, Urban Saddles out there yes, doing, I think your family participated yes. in that, um, <laughs> have learning horsemanship 101. This was a way of connecting to the history of the Westerns, these black cast Westerns that we talk about in the exhibition and the films of Herb Jeffries, who was the first black singing cowboy. Yes. Um, we did have scholars there as well. Mm -hmm. Folks did really quick talks that really th thought about some of the luminaries that we highlight in the exhibition. There's an area called the Glamour Wall in Regeneration where we have over 50 images of, um, of black performers looking glamorous, right? Not in the usual butlers and maids look that they would have in their films, but the ways that they would want to present themselves. And so we had um, people taking portraits of themselves in the kind of glamour tradition. Mm -hmm. um, no, it was just really remarkable. Things were happening across. We had um, uh, uh, all black women uh, food vendors uh, mm -hmm. out in our piazza. And what was really amazing to me, and we're going to take a look at a clip that really showcases a lot of this work, was just really the diversity of the generations of folks who participated and I hope were inspired by the exhibition. So maybe we could look at that clip. Summit, we have more than 40 people plus 12 organizations and groups joining us tonight, tomorrow, and Sunday. For the color of clay and how we curescape beneath the sky for our bend and bloom and beckon this poem. Tonight we're kicking off three days of learning, debate, and fellowship of looking back in order to shape a more equitable future of cinematic representation. I think you know what's really important about what's happening right now is that it's not a moment, it's a movement. Thanks for letting us show that. So this is one of the events that the Academy's put on, but there are others, right, that are going on. Can you talk about some of the ways that the Academy is bridging the gap between the museum and the community? Mm, yes, well, it's, it's pretty much daily mm. we're doing programming. Um, and it's been really important for us to think about ways, as I was saying, to connect to multi-generational audiences. Just yesterday, for example, uh, we have a Call Mornings program where visitors who are neurodivergent mm. can come and experience the galleries with the lighting a little bit higher, mm. the volume turned down. We do accommodative screenings with similar circumstances so that um, we're able to really meet people and make people feel comfortable. Mm. Um, we also think a lot about ways that we can be, uh, and the Regeneration Summit was a great example of this, but engaging community organizations and artists and paying them, mm. right? Like we're making investments. Right. The, there are partnerships that we do with local artists and companies for our retail store as well. Mm. Brick and Wood is a local um, design firm that 
worked with us on the design of our regeneration line um, of, uh, of tote bags and t-shirts and mm. socks, you know? Mm -hmm. So we think a lot about the, um, you know, the economic power that we have as an organization mm. and how important it is that um, anything that we do that is going to be meaningful to communities has to have some kind of community buy-in, participation, and dialogue. So that's just across the board. It's not just in our programming, but it's across so many things that we do. Awesome. Yeah. Yeah. Well, thanks for asking. Of course. All right. And then we. Oh, let's talk about reform school. Yay. <laughs> So Ellen is going to be modest, so I'll just say that she's written an article about Reform School <laughs> that's in the catalog. Yes. And it's an amazing discovery. Yeah, I mean, so there are these moments that we still have now, and we, we will have them into the future where we discover films that we thought were lost. You know, we thought they were, I mean, I looked at it as a script when I was a graduate student, and then to see it in, in the flesh, if you will, um, in, in the, the celluloid was really amazing. Um, you know, Louise Beavers, who was typically kind of a, um, you know, put into maid roles, um, she was actually quite a glamorous woman. And uh, the film really brings that out. Um, she wears furs, she wears hats, um, she's a club woman, so she's really invested in her community. Um, and she becomes a reform school matron in the film. This was kind of patterned off of a film that had been made with Humphrey Bogart a few years earlier, uh, where he does the same. But it's really interesting to me how um, they retool it to kind of make questions about, or to raise questions about racial justice in the United States in some ways in the film. So it was kind of for its moment, sort of a brave film, reform school. Um, and uh, yeah, here you're seeing also just the many hues uh, of blackness too, um, you know, with some of the actors lighter skinned, um, some of the actors darker skinned. Um, and so it's really, I think, quite a great reflection um, of some of the issues going on in the community at the time that we wouldn't have been able to see um, except for that it was, it was found in the archive. I, you know, and I, I finished my dissertation in 2007, so it was after that. <laughs> so, I mean, it's, it's like these are happening all the time. So that's why I keep going to archives and asking for things. You know, when you're looking for something, you think, oh, I read about that, you know, maybe that exists. It's worth asking yeah. um, because that's how things are found. Totally true. Yeah. <laughs> I know, I'm looking at the time, is but the time maybe really? this is our last image there. Are we going to open it to audience? Yeah, that would be great. Right. Yeah. Uh, so we're going to open it to audience Q&A now. Um, we're going to have Diane is going to be handing out a microphone. Um, all that we ask images. is that you please remember to ask a question. So use one of the five W's, who, what, where, when, or why, and end it with a question mark, not an exclamation point <laughs> or a period. All right, thank you. So uh, yeah, if you have a question, go ahead and raise your hand. All right, we'll start with this gentleman right down here in the front, and then we'll... I, I saw the oh, we're going to give you a microphone. I saw the film, uh, Freedom of Washington, with which she falls down, yes. about four years ago, she falls down on the, on the nightclub floor, and she dies, and got to move out the way and move it. Move. That's and, uh, now, um, those who make it to the film called Five, you got my tape on White Savage University's first technical movie, like 81 years ago. Oh. I sent it to you, you got the tape. Yes. Yeah, did you watch it? No. Oh, okay. I'm behind. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes, sir. Anyway, uh, Josie Baker did a film called The French Way. Is it available? Was that like 1944? It's, it's her Yes. French Way, French Way, or the French Day? Yeah, I think it's the French Way. I think you're right. Yeah. Uh, I have Siren of the Trumpets, which uh -huh. also did. Now, uh, the two other questions are this. They said that Louis uh, had like that made 300 movies. I find that difficult to believe. That's what movies that John Wayne made. Mm. I have never counted, but uh, it would have to be. It would have to be. It wouldn't be starring. She could have been in bit parts, and oh, I think it's over two hundred for sure. But she's not credited in so many of them that it would be hard to to you know pinpoint all of them. Now, Free to Watch the last movie was uh, One Mile from Hell in nineteen thirty seven, and, and and I think that's correct. And then uh, Paul Wilson's last movie was Hell in Manhattan yes. with Elton Watts in nineteen forty two. Are those correct? I believe so, yeah. yeah. Ellen, don't you think so? I think so, although he did try to make a film of Freedom Road in 1947. 
He created a production company to do so. Completed. It did not get completed. No. And I think, did he, he had the um, native land was, I guess, the same year as uh, um, uh, Tales of Manhattan. Yes. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Now, Bessie Smith did a movie called uh, uh, St. Louis Blues in 1928. I'm a member of the Museum of Modern Arts also. I saw that about 30 years ago at the Museum of Modern Arts. Is it still available? I think so. Yeah, that should be. I mean, I saw it at the Library of Congress, so I believe it's available there too. And yeah. That's yeah. Probably the only film she did. Probably. I think it is. Yeah. Yep. And we have that actually in the gallery, a clip from that film. Yeah. 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 Oh, okay. Thank, Thank you. Thank you so much. Great so questions. knowledgeable. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. We'll go down here. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Go ahead. Yes. Like the National Film, uh, National Film Review. The question is, what are some of the prerequisites for a film to be archived in the first place? Mm. Uh, at the Library of Congress or in general? Well, in general, because you know, there are certain films that are out now. You know, Boys in the Hood. Right. Film review and, uh, yes. Yeah, prerequisites is an interesting word to use. Mm. I mean, many studios for a long time did not care for their own materials. I mean, it, films were thought to be just, you know, temporary. You show them for a while and then that's it. So there was no archival sensibility. And then there were nitrate fires, uh, many famous ones. So a lot of the older films disappeared. And then there became this kind of increased understanding by the studios that they needed to preserve their work. But fortunately, um, Iris Berry, who was a pioneering archivist at MoMA, started collecting films in 1938 because she was making the argument that films are art and they need to be preserved alongside paintings and sculptures and so on. So that was really a pioneering moment for the film preservation. And then um, there are a lot of archives, like I mentioned, USC, UCLA, that started storing films kind of because the studios didn't have the, the will, the interest, was not making the resources available. So those are the entities that continue to collect now. Studios are doing a better job of it now that they're recognizing, you know, look at what happened with the, the Godfather, 50th anniversary, a new restoration, a theatrical release that ended up going much longer than was expected. So they're recognizing the value of their historical archives. And then when you look at more contemporary films, I think the studios are doing a better job now of recognizing, oh, we have to take care of these assets if we want to be able to go back to them in the future. But when you say like prerequisites, you're pointing to the fact that some films get saved and some don't. That has, that has been the case for a long time. Um, one of the interesting things that's happened over the last five or six years is that as celluloid production has decreased, um, a lot of film labs have been closing. And I did a project working on the LA Rebellion School of Black Filmmakers, folks like Charles Burnett, Julie Dash, Haile Garima, dozens of other black filmmakers who went to UCLA in the 60s and 70s. And we were trying to find their films. And some we could find, some we couldn't, some they didn't know where they were. And it turned out that many of them were still in these labs. So as an independent filmmaker, you take your negative to the lab and then you quickly get a print made, but then you may never pick your, your negative up again. <laughs> so when these labs started to close, they had like millions of feet of footage. And fortunately, the film archival community really rallied and came together. Uh, the, the Academy has actually taken on huge, huge, massive amounts of material. So it, part of it is ignoring the margins of our society, no question. But part of it was also just a general cultural lack of awareness and lack of resources to preserve films. But as Ellen was saying, like the more we ask and demand that these histories are saved, ask about these films, I think that we can have a big impact because the demand has to be there. Yeah. Thank you. Oh, I think there was. A well, hold on. We'll let we'll let some others go ahead. Yeah. Thank you. Did Did you have a question? Yeah. I want to thank. First, I want to say thank you for everybody for getting for getting right here. Yeah. All right. Thanks for coming. Thank you. Appreciate it. There we go. My question is. Mm. 
Mm. Oh, you got a list? You got a list? Okay. And let's hear them. <laughs> <laughs> this is a Quebec film. Okay. And it's subtitled in English. Huh. And the other one, that's from 1989. Okay. And also, of course, Sam Greenlee's The Spook Who Sat by the Door. Yes. That would be on TCM Underground. I, I okay. On, okay. <laughs> There's rights issues around that film. Okay. But. I love that film. I advocated very strongly to get that film in the National Film Registry, which it is. So, yes. I met Mr. Greenlee. He's from Chicago. Yes. yes. Very important film. Yeah. And then also, um, there's a documentary called The M Cure. Hmm. It's going for $350 on DVD right now. Oh. Wow. It's a Jewish documentary talking about prostitution in Argentina. Oh, my. And I was thinking since, you know, I've seen Yiddish films. Mm -hmm. Sure. Kind of sure. Thing, sure. Sure. Interesting. We've shown that on TCM. You know that? Sure. I've never seen it. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Welcome to New York. And that's from 2014. That's directed by Abel Ferrara. Oh, okay. Okay. No, All thank right. you for that list. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> All right, appreciate it. Uh, another one over here, yeah. Impure, I've never heard of that. Mm -mm. Thank you so much for being here. This is such a treat to hear you both speak. So thanks. Um, thanks. Going off of everything that's been said, where can we, what is the best place to look for, I mean, I know we have archives and the Library of Congress, but if people just want to watch a lot of these films, yeah. beyond just, you know, doing a, a search online and hoping for the best, what, and, and we talk about demanding, you know, there being a demand for these films, mm -hmm. how do we get that across? Who do we get it across to? Where do we go to search for these films? Because I want to see them. I know a lot of people want to see them, so yeah. what do we do? Yeah, this, this is great, the marching orders. So um, we are hosting right now a series at the museum inspired by regeneration called Try a Little Tenderness. It's curated by a woman named Maya Cade. And she created something called the Black Film Archive. And it's online. She basically did a kind of um, compendium of all the films that are currently streaming from various sources that you can watch. And I think dating back to the 20s, kind of 20s through the 60s. So a lot of the kinds of films that we're talking about, you can immediately see uh, through her website. Mm. And then a few years ago, I co-curated a five DVD set. I, did, I wasn't planning to do a commercial. <laughs> but it's called Pioneers of African American Cinema. It's a Kino box set that I did with Charles Musser. Um, and so that has dozens and dozens of the race movies that we're talking about. And what was really important for me in that is that we didn't just include um, complete films, but even films that have a lot of nitrate damage or they're just partial prints, just to try to see as much as possible. But in terms of like who to contact, like when you, when you come up with a title, like you have that list of titles. You see what he just did? He just asked me to get these on TCM, like that. <laughs> um, <laughs> TCM is a really important area to give exposure to these kinds of films. Mm -hmm. And we, you know, we're always listening and wanting to show more. So I, I just really appreciate that because that's the kind of thing that then says, OK, is there a print of this? And if not, then when programmers are trying to show these films, then the dialogue starts to happen with archives and with the rights holders around how to get access to them. So whatever research you have on the films is actually really helpful. Because we're constantly trying to like locate things, and it's not clear that they are actually extant, but sometimes they are. Um, and if you can, whatever threads, and now there are so many tools that we all have at our disposal in terms of digital, mm -hmm. you know, resources that we can use to research films. I mean, like in the work that Ellen and I do, we're constantly looking in black newspapers from the 20s, 30s, 40s to kind of retrace where were these films shown and right. who are the producers and you know mm -hmm. those are the traces that that any of us could be looking at. Right, and I think you know UCLA too. I mean. There are the archive there um, interfaces with the public as well, and you know you can you can look at some of the films there, um, in in screening rooms there, um, and there are quite a few films. I'm thinking of a few now that I mean Countdown at Cusini, which is um, a film made by Delta Sigma Theta, 
uh, in the 70s, right? They, per they financed a film, right? Um, uh, Robin Means Coleman writes about that film. But yeah. I'm looking at my cousin Leah, because she's a Delta, and I don't <laughs> you know about that film. <laughs> <laughs> so it's a Ruby D. Ossie Davis film from the 70s that was produced by Delta Sigma. So these, they own that film at UCLA, so you can watch it there. I mean, so there are all these, and then there are a couple of others. I was thinking about this transition to sound. We were talking about that um, a couple weeks ago, um, you know, that Spencer Williams was really involved in this. And some of those films are on YouTube. You know, you can look on, Real Black is one of the channels I was looking at um, that has uh, these transitional films that Christie made, right, that were um, the, the Al Christie Company, yes. Um, that Spencer Williams is in and Roberta Heisen, and they're beautiful. They're just really, really beautiful films. So, um, you know, I think don't don't neglect the archive in your own backyard is one of the things, you know, because sometimes I'm like, oh, I'm searching, I'm, I'm emailing archivists, and I'm realizing this is actually available somewhere, right? Um, and so, um, and it's online, you know what I mean? And so, yeah, so that's, there's that, but then also um, asking people like Mark Quigley and uh, Maya Smuckler at the UCLA Film Archive, which is a local resource. Of the image? Yes. Yeah, that's fine. <laughs> All right, I think we have time for two more questions. Right, so the curators, when they were putting this together, there was a conscious decision. They were trying to almost give a prehistory to the black exploitation period because uh, Sweet Sweetback's Badass Song was released in 1971. Before that, there's Cotton Comes to Harlem in 1970 that Ossie Davis directed, amazing mm -hmm. film. But the real sort of um, uh, explosion of those films, like Shaft, Superfly, and so on, sort of picks up 1972, 73, 74. So 1971, they were really trying to think about that as this sort of watershed moment um, where you could still see how these filmmakers were trying to do something consciously political in the work um, because there was a lot of debate about the black exploitation films. Like, were they radical or not? Were they exploitation films and really just uh, you know, presenting aspects of black style and language and music and, you know, was it a kind of pseudo militancy, you know, or a kind of commercialized version of that. So what the, the, the curators wanted to do was to get us to think about the 80 years of black filmmaking before that moment. Yeah. All right, last one. What do you mean, afraid? Yeah, what a great question. You know, there, there are these um, stories, some people say they're true, some people say they're apocryphal, that when the Lumiere brothers were producing a film of a train, mm. that people would scream, you know, and back up, you know. <laughs> and uh, uh, for a long time, uh, accounts of film presentation would also describe like native people having that same reaction, thinking the image was real, like not understanding the moving image. So. It seems those stories are exaggerated, right? Like, because if, if some, you know, I don't know. If we think about some virtual reality thing happening <laughs> now, would we be like totally terrified? Maybe, maybe. but um, it became part of the lore of what was so engaging about the moving image, that it was so realistic. So maybe some people were scared, but I doubt that every time the first person, you know, saw a film that they were, Terrified by that. I just don't think that's true. Well, oh, that, yes. that's a, yes, still scary. <laughs> but I do remember from some local censorship ordinances that there was a prohibition on uh, guns being shot at the mm -hmm. camera, in the direction of the camera, because they were worried that people would be scared about that. Now, whether people were or not, it's not clear, but they heard that from somewhere. You know, it probably came from somewhere. So.
Yeah. And the earliest audiences were theater-going audiences. It was more of a middle-class um, entertainment, and then it very quickly became a very cheap working-class entertainment um, once you got into the, like the, the early 1900s. But at first, films would be presented along with live performances in theaters, even like lecture halls. Um, it was seen as a scientific innovation. Um, a kind of novelty that showed the way that new technologies were being used. So the very earliest audiences were middle class audiences, and then it became a kind of Nickelodeon scene, and that's when people became very nervous about the bad influence that movies could have on young people, on women, on immigrants. Um, because it was an entertainment that didn't require reading, they were just displays of stories. Yeah. All right. Um, I think we're going to hold off questions. They may be available in the lobby afterwards if people want to chat for a little bit. But uh, can we all give a big round of applause? Thank you so much.